Good evening. I'm Alan Cohen, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to Aspen for the 2016 annual meeting of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Scholars in Health Policy Research Program. As you know, this is As you know, this is the 22nd and final annual meeting of the Scholars Program. In some ways, it's hard to believe that so much time has passed since the program's first annual meeting more than two decades ago in Scottsdale, Arizona. That first meeting in April 1995, which brought together the first two cohorts of the scholars from the original three sites, Berkeley UCSF, Michigan, and Yale, was modeled after the annual meeting of the Foundation's Clinical Scholars Program. We tried to emulate the structure, format, and ambience of the Clinical Scholars Meeting. We chose a ritzy venue, the Scottsdale Conference Center, which had just completed a multi-million dollar renovation. We arranged for the entire group to visit a local comedy club. <laughs> the headliner was the actor who had played Biff Tannen in the Back to the Future films. Yeah. Now, you remember Biff the guy who was always buried under a pile of manure in three films. And we had a Southwestern-themed dinner, complete with a strolling mariachi band that serenaded us, courtesy of the Conference Center CEO, who just happened to be a trustee of Boston University. And although most attendees gave the meeting reasonably good reviews, the experience taught us several valuable lessons about our program's evolving culture and how to plan for future meetings. First, don't hold the meeting in April when both scholars and faculty members are preoccupied with other things. Move it to late May or early June so as to give scholars adequate time to complete their research projects and to maximize fac faculty attendance at the meeting. Second, dispense with the planned entertainment. <laughs> Let the scholars and faculty create their own entertainment, which later took shape in the form of late night poker games instigated and led by the Michigan Mafia. Third, never, ever allow program participants to wear cowboy hats and bandanas again. <laughs> By the way, Bill Encinoza was the only one who looked good in that. <laughs> if you're trying to picture this, just turn to page seven of the Shutterfly book and <laughs> let your imaginations run wild. Um, last, because several scholars voiced concerns that the plush surroundings were out of step with a philanthropy like RWJF that prided itself on addressing the health needs of low-income populations, we decided to move the meeting to a venue that didn't exude opulence, but was comfortable and scenic, with a campus-like feel that more closely fit the ethos of the program's academic community. There were surprisingly few venues that met these specifications, but we were fortunate to find the Aspen Institute, as this place was known in those days. Now, the city of Aspen is quite affluent, as you know, but the meeting venue here at the Meadows is modest compared to our early experience at Scottsdale. When we arrived in 1996, we found Aspen to be more beautiful than we had imagined, and it soon became extremely popular with program participants. The Bauhaus-style guest rooms, though a bit spartan and seemingly dated in their furnishings, were actually, by design, very comfortable, quite large, and efficient. I recall one scholar in an early cohort commenting that he could house a family of four in his room. And he was willing to do it as long as we could find low-income people in town. Now, meeting participants also were quite taken with the comfort and quality of the meeting rooms, the quality and variety of the cuisine, and the beauty of the surroundings. Borrowing a page from the Clinical Scholars Program Playbook, we created blocks of free time during the afternoons to enable people to socialize and interact with colleagues while strolling into town, walking the nearby trails, bicycling or river rafting, or hiking near the Maroon Bells. It was no accident that the annual meeting soon came to be called by many the Aspen Meeting. It was here that we experimented early on with different types of sessions, ranging from disciplinary roundtables and alumni research panels to journal editor panels and invited guest speakers. Reactions to these experiments often were by people either loved or hated them. After a few years, though, it became evident that the scholars themselves preferred a format that showcased their work. 
So we settle on the now time-honored formula of all scholars all the time, in which the meeting was devoted entirely to the scholars' research presentations, with ample free time for collegial networking in between sessions. From 1996 until 2009, we met here 14 consecutive times. It took an economic downturn, coupled with a foundation-imposed no-fly zone order, to keep us away. From 2010 through 2015, we traveled each year to a different location, La Jolla, California, a nice place, but it too joined the no-fly list soon afterward. <laughs> Leesburg, Virginia, serviceable, but nothing spectacular. Princeton, New Jersey, convenient to the foundation, but lacking the scenery and amenities of many other places. <laughs> Indianapolis, Indiana, what a surprise. Great food in a very nice hotel in a pleasant city. And my personal favorite, Itasca, Illinois. <laughs> a noisy air conditioner in the auditorium, no real place to take a walk, and subpar food. But at least no one bowled alone. <laughs> After the travel restrictions were lifted, we met last year in Coronado, California, perhaps the best venue during our nomadic period. But all the while, people still yearned for a return to Aspen. Well, that day has finally come, and as Ruben Rumbot is fond of saying, quote, keep calm from Coronado to Colorado. The program has finally landed. So you also might say that we've saved the very best for last, but you can judge for yourself over the next two days. No matter how you look at it, we're back in Aspen for the 15th and final time, and we're looking forward to another great meeting. Now, despite having had only one cohort of scholars in residence during the final year, we in the MPO have worked hard to keep the faith with them and with all alumni by maintaining and strengthening the community of scholars that we collectively have built and nurtured over the past quarter century. Together with the three program sites, we've done our best to make this final year a memorable one. Back in September 2015, we launched a joint alumni mentoring network between the Scholars Program and the Investigator Awards and Health Policy Research Program. The aim of the network has been to enable scholar alumni to link with senior scholars or investigators who generously provide mentoring and career counseling. The network has been growing, and we plan to expand it as broadly as possible during the coming year before the Investigator Awards Program winds down in August 2017. We also have continued to sponsor joint alumni networking receptions at the annual meetings of major disciplinary associations and professional organizations, including ASHICON, ASA, APSA, APAM, MPSA, and PAA. These networking events will continue during the coming year and will include alumni for both the scholars and investigator awards programs. On October 16, 2015, the Berkeley UCSF Scholars Program held a one-day conference on the future funding landscape of health policy research. Speakers were drawn from the California Healthcare Foundation, the Commonwealth Fund, the Russell Sage Foundation, RWJF, and the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. The panel sessions included alumni from several RWJF programs, including not only this program, but also the Investigator Awards Program and the Health and Society Scholars Program. On March 31st, April 1st of this year, the Michigan Scholars Program held a celebratory research symposium featuring research presentations from 14 Michigan program alumni. The symposium also was an alumni reunion of sorts and was attended by 41 Michigan program alumni, plus numerous faculty members and past site directors, three NAC members, and two foundation staff members. The research presentations were outstanding and a good time was had by all. And recently, on May 18th, the Harvard Scholars Program held a combined mini-conference and alumni reunion for program alumni living in New England and the Northeast. The mini-conference included three panel sessions that contained alumni from all four program sites and was followed by a reception and dinner at the Harvard Faculty Club. At the NPO this year, we've been updating the alumni database with new information received from all of you and have been conducting a self-evaluation that will produce a summary report detailing the program's history, accomplishments, challenges, and lessons learned. The full report will be available in the fall. We are delighted, though, to share with you at this meeting another product of this past year's NPO labors, 
a Shutterfly memory book containing photographs from past annual meetings and program events, and we hope that you enjoy it. So tonight, as we gather for the very last time as a program community, it is my privilege to introduce three very special people, the members of our National Program Office staff. So I'll begin with Katie Player. <laughs> Katie is the Deputy Director for the Scholars Program, as you all know. Katie has served in this capacity for the past nine years, and I do not exaggerate when I say that the NPO would crumble without her. She does so many things, large and small, for the program and does them so well that her contributions are simply golden and she will be sorely missed after the program closes. Jed Horowitz. <laughs> Jed is Deputy Director for the Investigator Awards Program. Although he has served in that capacity only since 2013 when our office assumed leadership responsibility for the Investigator Awards Program, his involvement with the Scholars Program also dates back nine years when he first served as the program's research analyst. Over the coming final year of the Investigator Awards Program, he will oversee activities that have been jointly conducted with the Scholars Program, such as the alumni uh, networking receptions at professional meetings and the joint alumni mentoring network. And meet the newest member of our NPO team, Tracy Brown. <laughs> Tracy joined us in late December and replaced Melissa Manolis as the program manager for both the Scholars Program and the Investigator Awards Program. And she's been doing a terrific job. This is her first and unfortunately also her last annual meeting of the program, but she's taking everything in stride. She'll be working with Jed and me over the coming year to keep everyone informed about program alumni news, accomplishments, and networking events. The dedication and professionalism of Katie, Tracy, and Jed are amazing. I can honestly say that this meeting would not be as well planned and organized as it is were it not for their exceptional abilities. Feel free to seek them out if there's anything that they can help you with over the next two days. Uh, we're delighted to have two foundation officers with us for this final meeting, and you will be hearing from both of them over the next two days. First, I'd like to introduce Lori Melliker. <laughs> Lori is a team director at the foundation, and she has been the primary officer responsible for overseeing the scholars program. She spends most of her time these days directing the foundation's pioneer portfolio, but for well more than a decade, she has worked closely with the Scholars Program and has contributed importantly to its success. As many of you know, Lori is an economist, and we have been extremely fortunate to have her intimately involved in the program over time. Tomorrow evening over dinner, she will talk about the Foundation's four core areas and its three new research programs. And I'd like to introduce John Lumpkin, who is... John is Senior Vice President and Director of Targeted Teams at the Foundation. Um, he has attended several past annual meetings, and we're glad to see him here once again. Uh, tomorrow evening, following Laurie's talk, he will bid farewell to the scholars and alumni, telling them about life with RWJF after the program ends. I don't know exactly what he plans to say, but if I were to guess, it would likely be a cross between Rihanna's hit song, Farewell, and the Jackson 5's Never Can't Say Goodbye. And you thought that we exaggerated when we told you that you would be part of the Foundation's family for life. So you'll hear more from, from John about that. There are three honored guests that I'd like to welcome back to Aspen, and I'd like each to take a bow. First is Jim Marone. Jim was a longtime NAC member who served on the original five-member steering committee that helped the foundation chart the course for the scholars program. Um, Jim's Aspen adventures, or misadventures, depending upon your point of view, are legendary and account for about 80% of the program's total folklore. Um, you will hear from him on Friday morning. Jim, we're delighted that you can make it to this final meeting. David Colby is in the house tonight. You 
can sit down now. <laughs> David formerly was vice president for policy and before that vice president for research and evaluation at the foundation. For many years preceding Laurie, he was the principal officer responsible for overseeing the program. You'll also hear from him on Friday morning. David, it's great to see you again at an annual meeting. And back by popular demand is Eileen Connor. Eileen served as program deputy director for 13 years between 1993 and 2006. But that's not all. She came out of retirement in 2007 to help me recruit Katie, Melissa, and Jed to the MPO, thereby saving the program from disaster and preserving my sanity. <laughs> I, I'm sure that if we had asked her to come out of retirement yet again, she'd do it, just like Larry Holmes or Brett Farr. But she's having way too much fun with her grandchildren to seriously entertain such thoughts. Eileen, welcome back. We're thrilled to have you here. As this is the final meeting of the program, there is no better time than the present to honor and thank an extraordinary group of individuals whose selfless devotion to the program's mission and goals has contributed mightily to its, its success. I'm referring, of course, to the site directors at the three participating universities and the members of our National Advisory Committee. So we'd like to begin by honoring the site directors whose dedication to the program is unsurpassed. They do the heavy lifting year in and year out at their respective sites, corralling, cajoling, and doing whatever is necessary to get faculty members to teach seminars, to mentor scholars, and to participate in collaborative research. Without their leadership and tireless efforts, the scholars would not enjoy the full benefits of the program in order to fulfill their professional goals. As I call your name, please come forward and receive a plaque honoring your service to the program. And Katie, I'd like you to come up here as well. Ann Keller. <laughs> Ann, she'll find her way up here eventually. Anne is the director of the Berkeley UCSF Scholars Program. She's the newest site director, having stepped into John Elwood's large shoes one year ago. And most importantly, when she assumed that role in 2015, she went in with eyes wide open, knowing full well that she would be directing the site during its final year. Talk about self-sacrifice and taking one for the team. But in many ways, Anne's dedication to the Berkeley UCSF site should come as no surprise. After all, she was a Cohort 9 scholar there years ago. Thank you, Anne, for being unselfish and for doing a great job this past year in leading the site, in working with Alicia Alvarez Villasenor and Elisa Fadaracci, and in organizing last October's conference on the future of health policy research funding. So we have something for you. Thank you. Edward Norton. <laughs> Edward is the director of the Michigan Scholars Program. He came to the University of Michigan with only one goal in mind, to succeed Paula Lance as director of the Michigan Scholars Program. <laughs> Now, I exaggerate <laughs> slightly. The program wasn't his only reason for joining the Michigan faculty. There obviously were many other attractions. But the program indeed factored into his decision to make the move from Chapel Hill, and he succeeded Paula as site director in 2011. Now, many people over the years, especially NAC members, have opined that the Michigan program was and is a well-oiled machine that could operate efficiently without much oversight. So how difficult do you think Edward's job has been these past five years? <laughs> In truth, even well-oiled machines need clear direction and a little lubrication. Edward, you have done a marvelous job in Ann Arbor with the expert assistance of Teresa Ramirez and Gail Picknick, and we are grateful for your strong leadership. The Alumni Research Symposium in March was a fabulous success. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. 
Kathy Swartz. How soon we forget we're academics. Okay. <laughs> Kathy, as you know, is the director of the Harvard Scholars Program. She has been actively involved in the Harvard program since its inception, serving in a supporting role at first, but taking over the reins as director from Nicholas Christakis in 2005. For more than a decade, she has had to contend with internal politics at Harvard, with periodic uncertainty as to whether the program could retain its office space, and with the challenges of keeping faculty engaged in the program. One NAC member likened her to being the ship's captain, navigator, cook, engineer, and cabin steward, running constantly from the wheelhouse to the mess hall to the engine room, stopping periodically only to rearrange the deck chairs up top. <laughs> with the help of two dedicated faculty members, Peter Marsden and Mary Waters, and the able assistance of Sage Kochavi, Kathy, Kathy rose above these challenges and kept the ship afloat. Kathy, we thank you for 11 long years of leading the Harvard program. And if ever there existed a non-denominational sainthood for the trials and tribulations of a site director, you would be the obvious recipient. What about Paul? <laughs> um, and finally, we'd like to recognize and honor John Elwood, who unfortunately could not be here tonight because of health reasons. As some of you may know, John has had back problems in recent years, and traveling to this meeting would have been very difficult for him. I told him that we would miss him terribly, but that we wouldn't want the program to inflict any more pain upon him than it has already <laughs> has. He says as regards to everyone present, John is the Dean of Site Directors, having served in a leadership capacity at the Berkeley UCSF Scholars Program from 2003 to 2015. First as Acting Director when Richard Scheffler was on sabbatical, then as Co-Director with Richard the following year, and subsequently as the one and only Director until passing the baton to Anne last year. Like Kathy, John also had to contend with the ugly inner workings of his university, which often conflicted with the goals of the scholar program. <laughs> At times, various crises arose, including restrictive union hiring practices that made it difficult to recruit and retain program staff, and periodic administrative snafus in which incoming cohorts of scholars sometimes did not receive program benefits as expected because a certain administrator in the School of Public Health, as one scholar told us, was, quote, gleefully unhelpful, end quote, in signing, in signing them up for health insurance, library access, and other necessities. <laughs> Throughout all of these episodes, John was unflappable. He provided steady leadership in the face of a complex Berkeley administrative infrastructure that he likened on more than one occasion to, quote, the last Stalinist bureaucracy on the face of the earth, end quote. We thank John for his stalwart efforts over the years. Tonight, by order of the Politburo, we honor him <laughs> as a hero of the Berkeley Soviet and confer upon him the order of Aaron Woldovsky, which, which is the Berkeley equivalent of the order of Alexander Nevsky, who, by the way, is a saint canonized by the Russian Orthodox Church. So unfortunately, John is not here, but we will be sending him his plaque. So, <laughs> Now I'd like to turn to the members of our National Advisory Committee. In addition to providing valuable advice to the Foundation and the NPO, the NAC always work closely with the sites to assure that the scholar selection process each year admitted the best candidates to the program. They also have served as incredible role models for the scholars, exemplifying the highest standards of scholarship in their respective disciplines as well as in health policy. 
while participating actively in annual meetings and site visits and giving generously of their time, counsel, and advice to scholars. Just amazing work. The program has been truly blessed to have had such an illustrious and industrious group of individuals populating the NAC. However, before we begin with the individual honors, I'm sorry to say that Barbara Sinclair, a former NAC member whom we hope to see here for this celebration, succumbed to cancer this past February. She was a tremendous contributor for many years and her presence is greatly missed. Also, David Mechanic had planned to attend but had to withdraw for family medical reasons. His presence also is missed. And Bill Evans, who was an NAC member for many years, had to bow out for work-related reasons, but he sent this message. Quote, I want to say how grateful I am to have been a part of a scholar's program. The meetings in December when we reviewed packets were the most genuine, honest, and authentic exchange of ideas I've ever had in academics. People were allowed to speak, we disagreed, and we moved on without any hurt feelings. It is what academics should be about. That was really brought about by the tone set by you and Mark." End quote. Tonight, however, we're very fortunate to have 11 of 12 current NAC members present. Only Eric Potoshnik could not be here owing to family commitments. However, we thank Eric in absentia for his three years of valuable service from 2013 to 2016. For the 11 who are present, as I call your name, please come forward and accept a certificate from the foundation honoring your participation as an NAC member, along with a small gift from the NPO as a token of our deep appreciation for your service. Lauren Baker, is Lauren here? We, we knew that Lauren might be delayed, so. Um, Lauren is a professor of health research and policy at Stanford University. Um, he has served on the committee since 2013. You probably don't know that we offered him a place in cohort one, but he turned us down to join the Stanford faculty. In retrospect, this undoubtedly was a good decision for him, but we always regretted losing him. While we may have been unsuccessful in recruiting him as a scholar, we're truly thankful that he agreed to join the NAC years later. So we thank Lauren for his service. Cozily Simon. <clears throat> Cozily is professor in the School of Public and Environmental Affairs at Indiana University. Like Lauren, Cozily became an NAC member in 2013. Although her time on the committee has been relatively brief, she never ceases to amaze us with her extraordinary ability to lead a highly active academic life while raising six young children. She even joined us on a site visit with a child under each arm. <laughs> We're still uncertain as to how she manages to juggle her responsibilities, but we are never disappointed. We're just too exhausted watching her do it. <laughs> and I understand she is without any children this time, so she's free for once. <laughs> Cozily, we gratefully thank you for your service. <laughs> Deborah Carr, Debbie Carr. Uh, Debbie is professor and chair of sociology at Rutgers University. She joined the committee in 2012. Like Lauren, she too got away from us. I do not recall the exact cohort in which we nearly captured her as a scholar, but I do remember the circumstances. She was an assistant professor at Michigan who was coming up for tenure review and wanted to be a part of the Michigan Scholars Program. But program rules at that time dictated that she move to one of the other sites. And though another site eagerly hoped to have her in its cohort, the pressure to satisfy the tenure and promotion requirements in Michigan forced her to stay in Ann Arbor. For years, we felt a sense of loss that dissipated only when she joined the NAC many years later. We have rejoiced ever since. And Deborah, we thank you for your service. John Cauley. <laughs> John is professor of policy analysis and management and of economics at Cornell University 
and co-director of Cornell's Institute for Health Economics, Health Behaviors, and Disparities. John also joined the committee in 2012, but he had a long history with the program before then, having been a Cohort 6 scholar in the Michigan program. John is one of those rare individuals who, busy as he is with so many responsibilities at Cornell and with ASHICON, he still finds time to host or co-host alumni networking receptions. Over the years, he has astutely recruited younger program alumni to Cornell. And with alumni like John, it's easy to build a community of scholars in health policy research. So John, we thank you for your service as an NAC member. <laughs> Andrea Campbell. Andrea is department head and the Arthur and Ruth Sloan Professor of Political Science at MIT. Andrea has been an NAC member since 2011. But like John, she too has a history with the program dating back to her time as a Cohort 8 scholar at the former Yale site. She's been a terrific NAC member, contributing to all aspects of the program and serving as a role model for younger scholars. In addition, in addition to producing scholarly work, she has written for lay audiences including a compelling account of her sister-in-law's health problems and struggles in navigating the maze of health insurance in America. Andrea, thank you for your many contributions to the program. <laughs> Ruben Rumbot. Ruben is Distinguished Professor of Sociology at the University of California, Irvine. Like Andrea, Ruben also joined the committee in 2011. In addition to his scholarly contributions, he has brought a wry sense of humor to the committee. He not only enlivened the discussion around scholar applicants during the selection process, but also was a great traveling companion on a side visit to Michigan, where one night we sampled a wine from Argentina. It was an astonishingly smooth and wonderfully enjoyable wine, and Ruben, true to form, went home and researched its origins thoroughly. He discovered that it contained eight different grape varietals that had been accidentally mixed together as a result of a 2011 earthquake in the Mendoza region. Based on his research, some of us immediately went out and purchased every last remaining bottle that we could find. Ruben, it has been a great pleasure to have you as an NAC member, and we all agree that you could be our wingman and sommelier anytime. <laughs> Thank you for all of your contributions to the program. <laughs> David Pello. David is the Delson Professor of Environmental Studies and Director of the Global Environmental Justice Project at the University of California, Santa Barbara. David has been a member of the committee since 2010 and previously had been a Cohort 5 scholar in the Berkeley UCSF program. It's a little known fact that David left the program after only one year when both he and his wife were recruited to faculty positions at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Richard Scheffler and I did all that was humanly possible to keep him in the Berkeley UCSF program, including making flexible travel arrangements, but that would have meant long periods of separation from his family, and in the end, David felt that family had to come first. We respected his decision to depart after one year. It was kind of like watching Luke Skywalker not complete his Jedi training. <laughs> but, but what the hell, we knew he would become a superstar. So when an opportunity came along to recruit him to the NAC, we pounced. Fortunately, when he agreed to join the committee, he already had attained the level of Jedi Master. David, we thank you for your service to the NAC. <laughs> Diane Pinderhues. Diane is Professor of Political Science and Africana Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Diane has served on the NAC since 2008, and she has been a real trooper. 
not only in terms of her contributions to NAC discussions during scholar application review, but also in terms of having participated in site visits at all three universities over the years. One of those site visits occurred during the recession in 2010, and as part of an austerity measure intended to reduce travel expense, Diane joined the visit by virtual means. However, during the call, the technology failed, um, and Diane somehow was disconnected. For 20 frustrating minutes, she desperately tried in vain to get our attention, but we didn't realize what had happened <laughs> and simply thought that she was being unusually quiet. <laughs> when she finally was able to reconnect, she vented her frustration, <laughs> and who could blame her? After that experience, site visits returned to what they had been, <laughs> actual in-person visits. <laughs> Diane, we're grateful that you didn't resign from the committee on the spot that day, and we thank you for all of your service to the NAC. <laughs> Karen Cook. <laughs> that long Oscar walk you know, to, the, to the front. Here we go. Karen is the Ray Lyman Wilbur Professor of Sociology and the Director of the Institute for Research in the Social Sciences at Stanford University. Karen has served on the committee since 2002. She has been a source of incredible stability among the sociologists on the committee. Whenever we needed to recruit new members, she was always helpful in identifying fantastic candidates. What else would you expect from a sociologist who is a leading scholar in social psychology? Like our other NAC members, she has held high-ranking academic positions within her university, but always found the time to participate fully and actively in all program activities. Karen, thank you for your dedicated service to the program. <laughs> Bobby Wolf. Bobby is the Richard A. Easterlin Professor of Economics, Population Health Sciences, and Public Affairs in the LaFollette School of Public Affairs at the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison. Ever since she joined the NAC in 1997, Bobby has been an indispensable member, always willing to help with whatever was needed, conducting site visits, moderating sessions at annual meetings, and recruiting economists to the committee. And like other NAC members, she always found time to do things for the program despite heavy responsibilities at Wisconsin, including being director of the La Follette School of Public Affairs for several years. Bobby, words cannot fully express our gratitude for your 19 years of outstanding service on the NAC. And last, but certainly not least, Mark Peterson. <laughs> I know it, it, it feels a little like NFL draft day, but I'm not. <laughs> but I ain't Roger Goodell. Mark is professor of public policy, political science, and law, and also currently is the chair of the Department of Public Policy in the Luskin School of Public Affairs at UCLA. Mark has been a committee member since the beginning of the first Clinton administration. You do the <laughs> math. And he has provided exceptional leadership as chair since 2002 when Rashi Fine stepped down. Some of you will recall that Mark achieved rock star status several years ago <laughs> when scholars routinely acclaimed his policy talks in annual meetings. I will bet that somewhere in Prince's treasure trove of unpublished music, there is a song titled, Mark Peterson Rocks. <laughs> and if there isn't, there really ought to be one. But in all seriousness, Mark has been a remarkable leader, colleague, and friend. I have turned to him countless times over the years for advice and support, and he has never disappointed me. Mark, having you as committee chair for the past 14 years 
translated into a partner whose wisdom, friendship, and trust made my job much easier. devoted service to the program. <laughs> really wanted to hit that uh, century mark. But <laughs> <laughs> Tonight, I'm delighted to report that 71 alumni are attending this year's meeting, more than we have ever had in the past by far. While I would love to recognize each of them individually, we'd be sitting here until tomorrow's breakfast if I tried to introduce them all. So would all program alumni be so kind as to stand for just a moment while we take this opportunity to honor you. <laughs> okay. We'll have you come up. And I'm told that Lauren Baker is now in the house. So Lauren, come up here. It's So, so Lauren, I, I, I told them already that we tried to recruit you, but you turned us down for Stanford. And no, 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 no. It was, it was the right decision at the time. We, we know that, and, but we're really glad that you agreed to join the NAC years later. So we thank you for your three years of service on the committee. Bye. So I, I apologize for the length of tonight's program. I know it's beginning to seem like the Academy Awards. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, I'm not Chris Rock or even Neil Patrick Harris. But then again, how often does one get the opportunity to close down a longstanding program? So please bear with me just a little bit longer as I explain what's in store for you over the next two days. Yes. Oh. Every year, we hear about how great we all are. And we forget the one really great person, actually three, but let's start with the really great, the heart and soul of this program. The current knack has asked me to say just a few words about you know who who never gets the praise as he's giving it out year in and year out. When I first got into health policy, it was an unusual thing for a political scientist to do. I won't tell you the year, but I had a colleague who gave a talk in health politics at Duke, and the chair of the political science department said, well, what does political science have to do with health care? Alan saw this problem across the social sciences when he was a foundation officer at Robert Wood Johnson. And he thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna design a program. First, he had to explain to the people at Robert Wood Johnson back in those dark days what social science was. He had a terrible time explaining political science. It took him a couple of years to get it, but he worked away at it. And then he put a small committee together, five people, as you mentioned. Let me tell you just a word about that committee. We were like, what, what? how is this going to work? Alan already knew, but he needed a little cover. So we'd say, well, how about this? How about that? And he'd sit there going, yeah, it could be work. How about this? And we'd say, oh, yeah, that's great. How about that? Yeah, that's great. And so Alan could have designed it in his closet, but he designed it in a small room with four people basically cheering him on. <laughs> we had no clue. How does this work? You're going to remake social sciences with foundation money? make them think about healthcare policy, but he had this vision. And a year later, there we were at the first annual meeting, about which the less said the better. <laughs> By year four or five, the program was fantastic. And we all thought, well, okay, rest on your laurels. 
But Alan, well, you know Alan, always making it better, always raising the program to this day, making this a better program. It's hard for me to be serious with Alan because I always want to fool around. But let me say one serious thing. Of the people I've known, not only who've changed our world of health policy, but have changed what we do in the social sciences, what we do in political science and sociology and economics, very few people have had the kind of impact that Alan had. So now the inscription, the NAC members have bought Oliver Sacks' last book, Gratitude, which ends with Sabbath, the essay he wrote just before his death, in which he talked about finally learning to take a break. <laughs> and Ruben has re written these words with, on behalf of the NAC, with gratitude to Alan, in fond memory of our work together, as we approach our own Sabbath, we, as uh, the seventh day of our life, as a program, knowing that our work is well done, and one may, in good conscience, finally rest. Alan, on behalf of everybody, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you want to say a word? Oh, definitely. Thank you. I, I am really touched by this. And now, since uh, Jim has outed me, I'm out of the closet. So, you know, I'll be thinking about other things in the future, but I'll, I won't be doing it with a small committee. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. I, I really appreciate this, and I appreciate all the sentiment. I want to thank all the members of the NAC. This is a, a wonderful tribute. I, I, I really, really appreciate it. But on with the show. So, I do want to tell you what's in store for you in the next two days. <laughs> So, and I'm, no, I have personal reflections on Friday. I, I will have, two have more. <laughs> two more copies? Yeah. I thought this was the only one. It's not. <laughs> Just a quick word. There's one other person who needs yet another bit of embarrassment, if you don't mind. Please. On the behalf of the NAC. The first NAC meeting was a mess. We didn't know what we were doing. We talked and we talked and we talked. We had a very hard time coming to, coming to decisions. If you were in the first cohort, I don't know how we found you. <laughs> the second year, we had this young political scientist. And he kept sort of nudging us to conclusions. Like, oh, I think the group has decided this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what we decided, yeah. <laughs> and it became smooth. And over time, we'd sort of look like, Mark, are we ready? And Mark said, I think we've come to this. Finally, we made him NAC chair. And ever since, it has been, as other people have said, an intellectual feast. And that wasn't all. Um, every NAC that Robert Wood Johnson had, who was running it? Mark Peterson, whether it was investigators or um, Hickfo and one after another. I won't go on because the hour is late, and I'm sure there'll be lots more embarrassing things to say about Mark over the course of the next two days. Friday morning. Friday morning. But as with Alan, you all know this. There's probably not a person in the room who has not gotten incredible feedback from Mark Peterson and our careers. Every one of us are better thanks to Mark. Mark, time for your Sabbath, too. Thank you from all of us. Okay, quickly, the men get the glory, but Katie, we know who does the work. 
How many times has there been a problem? How many times have we solved it? I know, I know, Alan was great, Mark was great, but to you, I won't go on and on, I'll just say on behalf of the NAC, on behalf of everyone, <laughs> thank you. It's now really on you.